while I was at, uh, attending Dallas Theological Seminary from 1981 to 1985, I did many jobs, as I've told you over the last 10 years, to survive. In fact, I've been asked by many of you, what kind of job have you not done? Well, I've done a lot of them. When you want to live and provide for your family and you're a poor student, you'll do most anything, correct? Uh, I mean, ethically speaking, of course. So um, I, I like to, uh, you know, I, I, I've done all kinds of jobs. I, I like the heavier, hard kind of jobs because of the kind of people that I meet there. So I've worked as a longshoreman loading railroad cars in college, and I've done all those kinds of jobs. So when I went to seminary, I was a, a gardener for the school because I love landscaping. And, uh, and I also worked uh, on the weekends for Allied Van Lines commercial division. So uh, both those jobs, very interesting. Uh, but I met a lot of really rough, lost people uh, working for Allied Van Lines. Uh, commercial division means that uh, we moved uh, offices all around the Fort Worth uh, uh, Dallas complex, even went so far down to uh, all the way to Houston to do things. Uh, and so they would uh, hire seminary students to work crews, especially with sensitive things that we would uh, move. Remember when computers used to take up entire floors of offices? I've been in those offices to move all those giant reels, and now it's probably down to, you know, the size of a desk. But uh, one of the things that we did, uh, a job uh, as seminary students for Allied Van Lines, was we moved a bank. Uh, and that was an interesting move, uh, because when it came down to moving the bank, we showed up at the site, they divided us into teams, and you could see this old bank on a corner uh, uh, in, in, in the Dallas area, and then next to it was a hill, and on the hill was a massive skyscraper. And so we're all going, wow, I mean, business must be good for this little bank, because they're moving from this little tiny old bank to this beautiful m structure. Uh, our job that day uh, the, uh, was to move all of the contents of the vault. Cool. <laughs> Uh, why would they ever pick seminary students to move the con? <laughs> yeah, right, they didn't go to local prison. That would have been like, yeah. Um, so our job that day was like the vault contents. But the vault contents for us were all of the safe safety deposit boxes of the bank. It was a big bank. And so what they did is they, they, we came in in crews and uh, unbolted all the safety deposit boxes, and they came out in sections that were about two tons a section. And so, so we had a hydraulic vol, uh, uh, devices to lift up each unit, and then we went in teams uh, out of the building uh, up a hill and into the, the new vault. That, we did that all day. It was a lot of work. I was dead at the end of the day, moving all that stuff. But what was interesting is they chose seminary students. Why? Because we understand the Eighth Commandment. What did Moses say? Thou shalt not what? Steal. So they knew we're not going to take anything. Even though we're poor, we need to pay tuition. Nothing's going to be missing from all of those things. Now, we did have discussions as we were moving those things. Wonder what's in here. But nobody tried to pick, you know, the, you know et cetera. The other thing is, uh, while we were moving all the contents up, up the hill uh, throughout the day, uh, lining the hill and even inside the vault were quite large, kind of lineman-sized Dallas police officers. They were everywhere. Have you ever seen a, a police officer from Texas? They're not normal. <laughs> They're like linemen. They're huge. So these guys were lining our way. Uh, every so many feet was a police officer, and he would have, you know, he was in full uniform. He had a side, sidearm, which looked like, you know, a, a trinket, because these guys were huge. And, and then on one hip of the officer was a pump shotgun. That was very motivational. <laughs> and, and they didn't talk and, and they didn't smile or anything. They were just like statues as we'd walk by. And it was like, don't even talk to that guy. Don't even look at him in the eyes. You know, shotguns. So they were protecting us from anybody that would try to rob the bank, correct? I mean, you're exposing the entire content of the vault. Uh, so it was a very interesting day as we did all that. And I learned much from that from a theological perspective. Remember, I've told you for 10 years, hopefully you got the picture, the memo, that when you look at your life, all of these things are instructive if you pay attention. So what possibly could you learn from moving the vault contents? What's theological about that? A lot. Think about your salvation. Is it not like a vault? I mean, think about it. I mean, it is. Because what Paul's going to teach you here in Romans 8, 28 to 30 is your salvation is so airtight from God's perspective. Why are you worried? That doesn't mean you don't have responsibility in light of said wonderful position, but he's going to tell you your salvation is so secure. Let me explain it to you because if you understand the essences of your salvation as you fight the world, the flesh, the devil, which he talks about in chapter 8, verses 18 to following, uh, you're going to have hope because you're going to know that on the, at the end of time, God's not going to look down from heaven and say to himself, I 
think we lost some along the way. You hear me? He's not going to do that because of what Paul says here. He's going to tell you that your salvation is secure from God's perspective, and then he's going to get into the details of how you got saved, and it's, it's going to be deep, I'm going to tell you, from his perspective. But he's so amazed at what God has done, he wants to tell you, let me give you another reason to have hope as you fight your sinful flesh and the devil and all the world can throw at you. And uh, we've studied this. Uh, the main motif from the passage uh, that we've seen thus far, which you should have burned in your memory banks because we're on to week six studying it, is simple. Stay hopeful in the fight with the flesh. Why? Well, uh, we've covered five reasons so far. You remember them all? No? Con confession. You don't remember them? Okay, we'll, we'll, there they are. There's the first three reasons. I'm not going to go into them because I don't have time. Uh, those are the first reason, reasons why you should have hope as you wade through this old world. Uh, we stopped last week on reason number five, to have hope in the world as you deal with sin and, and the devil, uh, is God is providential. And if God is providential and there's no such thing as chance, then everything that happens in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all are go going toward his purpose, which is going to be grand. I mean, that's just how he operates. And uh, I called my, uh, we were talking to my Jewish sister-in-law this week, uh, and we were telling her about our stove blowing up, and, you know, it turned out to be a Jewish, you know, kosher stove and a Shabbat stove, and she's like, this is amazing! And so this, I was able to build a bridge to talk to my Jewish sister-in-law uh, about theological things through a stove. Don't tell me God's ways are not amazing. Next time your stove blows up, consider God is at work. Anyway, moving on. Reason number six, uh, if God is providential, then let's look at that in relationship to salvation. Because if God has a purpose in his saving of us from a providential perspective, that then comes with a distinct purpose of why he saved me. This is a tremendous passage we want to look at. Before we looked at this passage, let's first, let's read the passage. Uh, Romans 8, 28 uh, through 30, we'll read it. Paul says, and we know that God causes all things, all things, Good, the good and the bad, uh, to work together for, uh, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom, he says, in a relationship to salvation, he, God, foreknew, he also predestined them to become conformed to his image, so that he might, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Uh, whom he predestined, Paul says, uh, these, he says, he also logically called, and whom he called, he says, he logically also justified them in his courtroom, and whom he justified by faith, well, Paul says, it's as if they're now glorified, even though from an eschatological perspective, glorification is future, it's a, it's a done deal on God's mind. Uh, easy concepts to talk about <laughs> in 30 minutes. The foreknowledge of God, predestination, election, justification, glorification, and behind them all is free will. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> I'm going to say a couple of things um, about this before we dive in. Uh, as he talks about God's providence and our redemption and how that should give you hope. Number one, this is in my estimation one of the most complex theological passages in all of the Bible. So which means don't send me a whole bunch of emails telling me you've got it all figured out because my next series will have to be on pride because there's no way. There's just no way. You can understand it to a degree and then uh, we'll get into it. You're, you're limited. I'm limited. Number two, uh, their propensity of Bible students, and I speak from experience, uh, is to dig so deep into these concepts of predestination, election, free will, all those, that you totally miss what you're supposed to do in light of them. That, well, I can understand and articulate the four views of predestination, give you the pros and the cons, the assets of liabilities of each one, but how has it affected your life? Well, uh, n not yet. You're predestined for it to affect your life. So don't get so caught up in the details, you, you miss what's going on in the passage, and we'll get there in, uh, eventually. Um, do you buy Girl, Girl Scout cookies? Yes. <laughs> Are they not from Satan? <laughs> I just stay away. The sleeve, you open it, it's gone. You know what I'm saying? They are designed to fit in the palate of most mouths. One goes in, thin mint, whatever, it's gone, correct? Who takes a bite? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the cookies, as it were, and we're going to stick them on the lower shelf so you can go, oh, that was tasty. So as we look at the cookies on the lower shelf, when we leave the lower shelf where the cookies are, uh, remember what we talked about when we put the cookies on the lower shelf, correct? 
I've lost you even in that. Okay, so stay with me. So here, here's the main cookie concept of this. Lower shelf, what's, what's Paul after here? here? Here it is, two sentences. Number one, God's pr providence uh, so forms the basis of your salvation that it, your salvation is locked up like a vault. And in light of the fact that your salvation is locked up like a vault, uh, you have a goal from God to live for him every day. That's what we're talking about in this passage. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's enjoy ourselves and look at what Paul talks about here. Uh, he's going to talk about three concepts in relationship to the providence of God and your salvation and why that should make you hopeful in, in this life. Number one, he's going to tell you in uh, chapter uh, 8, verse 28, uh, the last part of this section, uh, what I would call point C, uh, is there is a divine purpose in your salvation. Just the concept of purpose. Now, you may walk through life wondering, why have all these things happened to me? Well, God's looking down from heaven and saying, there's purposes tied to all of these if you pay attention. God always has a purpose. He, this is what he says here. God, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Who are the people who love God in the passage? Well, a Christian by definition is somebody who loves God. I mean, that is what a Christian is, someone who loves God. And Paul, Paul says here that all things in life, the tragedies and the triumphs, they all work together. Now, I'm going to give you this Greek word, and, and you're going to know what it is in English, and then that will then prove my point many times over that it's easy to learn Greek. <laughs> what say you? Uh, sooner geo is the word to work together. Sooner geo. Sooner geo. Sounds like synergy. Synergy. You know what synergy means? Synergy. I went to the fountain of all knowledge, dictionary.com. What does it say about synergy? It says this. Synergy is the interaction of elements that, when combined, produce a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual elements. What did he just say? When you put stuff together, it comes out cool, like a Girl Scout cookie, you know? Synergy, uh, putting things together that may not have necessarily ever been together, but when you put them together, it's primo. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever used epoxy? I'm probably speaking to the men here. I'm sure ladies don't use it in the kitchen, but epoxy. So what, what is it? It's two tubes mixed together, the epoxy and a hardener. And when you push the little syringe like you're a doctor doing surgery, uh, when they're mixed together, uh, what happens? You got glue, like in a major way. Just don't ever use it on teeth or anything. I mean, but just, so epoxy. So that's a synergistic relationship between those two things, the epoxy and the hardener, that make this glue of all glues. So Paul says all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the triumphal times, the tra tragedy, times of tragedy, all those things work together from God's perspective toward the good that he wants to accomplish in your life. He's always working. That's that bringing together of things, opposing to do something great because he's providential. So there's no such thing as chance then because he works on all of these things. Uh, toward those who, who love him. And then, he, and then he throws in this concept of this providential purpose by, uh, by telling you that he has, uh, from his perspective, called you. Because he says, to those who are called according to his purpose. Did God, did God call you when you got saved? I mean, you get a phone call, text message? Probably not. But I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt he was calling me. I was nine years old. And I was so bothered by the fact I was sinful. I mean, you didn't have to tell me I was a sinner. I totally got that picture. Especially after family members kept telling my mom, if you don't do something with him, he's going to wind up in prison. I was nine. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was under conviction of the Spirit of God. I didn't know what that meant. I went to the pastor one day. They had a, a dinner after church at his house. I went over to Dr. Lind, and, and I told him, I said, I, I was a nine-year-old kid. And I said, could I, could, I ask you to, could I talk to you privately in the living room? He said, sure. So I went in there to talk to him, and I go, okay, this is what's going on in my life. You're preaching, and I'm having issues. <laughs> Does that happen to you here? You know, and, and I said, what is up with that? And he goes, he put his big old arm around me. Uh, uh, he said, Marty. He was, he was a, a Navy captain. He was a chaplain as well, uh, based near our house. He, he said, Marty, the, that's the Spirit of God talking to you. He's calling you. What's he want? <laughs> well, he wants to know, are you going to follow him or not? Uh, and I got, I got saved not long there, thereafter. See, God call, calls us. There's two ways that God calls you. Uh, number one is what theologians would say is the external call to everybody. Kind of goes like this. Jesus, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are what? Weary and heavy laden. What's he say I'll give you? Rest. Rest for your soul. I'll give it to you. You come to me. 
Who's he calling? Everybody is called. That's the external call. It's a general call. It goes out to everyone. Uh, then there's the internal call. When I hear the general call, the internal call is he's speaking to me to saying, you're a sinner who needs the Savior. When I accept that and embrace that internal call, I'm saved at that moment. That's the internal call. You see this tension when you look at John chapter 1, uh, the book of Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 11. It says, he came to his own, and, and those who were his own, the Jews, did not receive him. Notice the contrast. But as many as received him, the internal call, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So they had to believe, even though they're called. They had to make a responsible choice. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, wasn't their idea, nor of the will of man. No, they were born by the will of God. He called them. They heard the general call. They accepted the internal call. And that proved that they, he had called them. They were his children. Uh, we have that going on in our service right now. The general call is for Jesus says, come unto me. That might be you. To respond to the internal call to trust him as savior, your life's radically changed. That's what Paul is talking about when he talks about your calling. Your calling is not just to call you, but it comes with a purpose. See, you're called, as he says, according to his purpose, not you. See, my life no longer, and it hasn't been for many years, it's not about my, my hopes, my dreams, my plans. Although I do plan and I love goals and objectives, etc. But I realize at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's, not about, it's never been about me. Who's it about? This is about him. Lord, where do you want me to work? Lord, who do you want me to marry? Lord, what, what do you want me to do in this situation? Lord, it's, it's about him. See, it's about him. See, it's his purpose. What is your purpose, God? And, and Paul will explain that here. Uh, the, the word purpose, uh, prothesis in Greek, uh, is the word used in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2, to describe the bread of the presence, prothesis. Presence is the word uh, that Paul is, is using here for purpose. Because the bread of the presence, the table of showbread, the 12 loaves of bread in the tabernacle or in the temple were uh, God's message to Israel as he looked at those 12 loaves of bread that I am your bread and your sustenance. You rely upon me. I will provide for you. It was a purpose of that bread. So Paul says, I can take that prothesis concept, that word, and apply it to God all day long. He has a purpose for you in your life. What is the plan uh, of God's divine purpose when it comes to my salvation? Well, that's where it gets interesting because he's going he's gonna to throw us into what I would call the Mariana Trench. What is the Mariana Trench? It's off the coast of Guam. It's 35,000 feet deep. That's deep. Like how deep? Well, it's deeper than Everest is high. Correct? Uh, it is so deep. It's, if you were to go down there, it's, it, the water pressure is eight tons per square inch. That'd be comfortable. <laughs> uh, they've likened it unto uh, stacking 50 jumbo jets on your chest. That kind of pressure. That, that's pretty deep. There's a thousand more times pressure down there than there is at, uh, at, the, uh, at the water level before you dive down. 35,000 feet plus. Why do I bring that up? Because diving into these verses here is like diving into the Mariana Trench. Why? Well, what does Paul talk about in two verses? For knowledge of God, predestination of God, the election of God, the justification of God, and the glorification of God of all saints. And in the background is free will. We can totally cover that concept all wrapped up into one. Absolutely we can because Paul's talking about it from the perspective of God. So as we look about uh, on, on, this, on these great concepts, I want to add a couple of things because uh, I know the kind of church that you are. So I need to press up, preface my remarks by making a couple of points. Number one, uh, as you look at those concepts, never forget Deuteronomy 29 verse 29, which says, the secret things belong to who? To the Lord. Who is he? is our God. But the things revealed to us belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of his law. So uh, does God have secrets? Does he? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's a softball question. Absolutely he does. God has secrets. Are you ever going to know that and understand all the secrets of God? No, not even in eternity because his thinking is so far beyond yours and mine. There's things that are secret in his mind that we just don't get. Like where did evil come from? Why is there evil? I mean, if he lived in a pristine environment, I'm bringing up another complicated subject, but <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I took one whole doctoral class from Dr. Geisler on said subject. The class was called On Evil. That was the name of the doctoral class. But I mean, where did it come from? I mean, I can tell you, and I took a whole class on it. But it's a mystery, is it not? I mean, why did God permit some of these things? Uh, so God has secrets. So at the end of the day, when you look at a foreknowledge of God, predestination of God, et cetera, all those concepts, realize uh, if you're going to start emailing me that you've got this figured out, no, you have not. Uh, because God has secrets he has not told us. So we do not understand how all these things fit together. Uh, number two, uh, his thinking is beyond your thinking. Uh, I did a little research on IQ level. And this is a church, I'm sure, with a high IQ level. Is it not? It's a very humble church. Is, is, it, is it not? I mean, think about IQ. I mean, how high can an IQ go? I did some reading on that this week. found it most interesting. There's a man uh, named Tareen Teo has an IQ of 230. He would be interesting to talk to, wouldn't he? You wouldn't understand a thing he said. Uh, Marilyn Voss Savant has an IQ of 228. There's another uh, individual, his name is uh, Kim Ung Young, IQ of 210. Could you have a conversation with these people about anything meaningful? Well, to a degree, but they understand things way beyond what you understand them, I'm sure. Uh, but could they have an in-depth conversation with God and figure out everything that he's doing? No, because we can't even understand what an IQ of like a thousand would be. What is an unlimited IQ like, God? So even the smartest among us cannot figure out these things because it's what God said in Isaiah 55 is so true. What did he say? Verse eight. God says to us, my thoughts, not your thoughts. Neither are my ways of doing things uh, your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts, well, by implication, they're higher than your thoughts. So my, my thoughts are finite and limited. His thoughts are infinite and unlimited. Does he ever have to learn anything? No, because he knows everything at all times and never forgets anything. He knows all things past, present, and future. Uh, when I was at the National Apologetics Conference back in October, uh, where Z Ravi Zacharias was the main speaker, um, I was one of the speakers uh, in one of the auditoriums. Uh, when I had some downtime, Liz and I went to a class on DNA structure. That's romantic. <laughs> so we had some time to kill. This is interesting. How does DNA structure point to the uh, master designer? So we, you know, I know something about it. It's not, I'm totally clueless. So we sat in there and we're kind of toward the back listening to the scientists speak from LA about it. And after about 10 minutes, I leaned over, over to Liz and I said, do you under, understand anything he's talking about? She said, uh, no, I, I don't, don't, do you? Mm -mm. <laughs> Let's leave. So we got up and walked out. <laughs> don't leave this sermon. I'm, I'm trying to explain things to you. I just merely, merely say, your thinking is limited, is it not? He got it, what he was talking about and all the scientists sitting there, but it was way past my pay grade. But does that mean that we can't you know, grasp it to a degree? Uh, you can understand this to a degree. Number three, uh, we cannot escape the limitations of our spatial dimensionality. We, you cannot escape, we have limitations. How many dimensions do we have? You're still trying to figure out what I talked about in the last section. Okay, so... <laughs> How many, how, many, how many dimensions do we have? Well, we have height, depth, breadth, and if you want to add a non-spatial dimension, time, we've got how many? We have probably four. Could we even understand eight? No. How about dimensionality level 1,000? No. See, this is why when Paul tries to write about heaven when he saw it, doesn't describe it. This is why when you read in Revelation chapter 21, when John writes what he saw, he uses metaphorical language. Why? He cannot describe it. it it's the finite explaining the infinite. So when you're looking at uh, our, our construction, realize not only do we have cognitive limitations, we're stuck in time and space in a, in a dimensional world that can't even comprehend his dimensional world. So where we get into trouble is we try to hold God uh, uh, in a discussion with, I, this seems incongruous. And he's looking from his dimensionality going, if you were only where I am, you would totally understand. See, if we were in a one-dimensional world, could we understand a three-dimensional person? Not really. So bear those things in mind as we look at the fact that when it says God foreknew us, what does that mean? It means he has absolutely perfect knowledge. 
past, present, and future. When he looked down the halls of time, uh, he foreknew us. He knew every single person, ipso facto, who would trust him as Savior. He would, by definition, have to know that. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, if he knew all things, then does it mean that I have a free will? Remember, from his dimensionality, he says, I knew you, that you would trust me. But he also says, for all throughout the scripture, I give you a choice. I can't bring those two things together with finite thinking. I leave that to God. But he says, I foreknew. He foreknew that one day at nine years old, I would trust him. Uh, and I did. Did I have the free choice to choose him? Yes. Do I understand the mystery of how he did that? No. First Peter chapter one, verse one, Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are what? Chosen. How? Well, according to the foreknowledge of God, I knew those believers in those regions. I chose them in eternity past to be my children. By God, by the sanctifying of the work of the spirit that you may obey, comes with responsibility, uh, Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace be and peace be yours in the fullest of measure. God foreknew them and he said, those are my children because I foreknew them. Uh, the view uh, is not without issues. There's no doubt about it. Uh, if God foreknew who was going to be saved and who was not going to be saved, then why did he create people he knew he was not going to ever allow into his heaven? Am I right? Do you understand that? I don't. But I leave that to God. That's his business. His call is to me to make a decision. I'll let him sort out the incongruities of how he does things because he's way beyond my thinking. Uh, it leads to that kind of authority question. Um, but there's always tension between what he does and has decreed and what I'm responsible to do. You see it in uh, Acts chapter 2. Peter says, verse 22, men of Israel, speaking to the Jews, men of Israel, listen to, the, listen to these words. Jesus of Na the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders, that validated who he was, uh, and signs uh, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered up by the, What? predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God you nailed to a cross. Notice the tension. God had a predetermined plan. What? To send the Messiah, the Messiah, the anointed one, to die for the sins of all mankind. I mean, it's prophesied in like Isaiah 53. But we have a responsibility to accept him. But we can also reject him. He has a plan to send the Messiah. We're responsible on our perspective to embrace the Messiah. Do you think those people who crucified the Messiah were not held accountable for what they did? No, he says, you are accountable for your free will action, even though it was predetermined by God what would happen. Does God have foreknowledge? Absolutely he does. He has perfect knowledge. If he has perfect knowledge of who will be his children, that leads logically to the golden chain of all the things that come after this. If he foreknows all that will be saved, that logically leads to predestination. Predestination, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Foreknowledge of God, by definition, ipso facto, leads to predestination. What's predestination mean? It means, the Greek word means to pre-plan a destiny. Pre-plan a destiny. That's what he did. Before the cosmos was created, we understand from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19, the Messiah was sacrificed in God's mind before he ever even made anything. Well, wow, talk about something that's hard to comprehend. Uh, he predestined his son to die, but then he called his son to come to earth based on his will. From God's perspective outside of time and space, he knew who would be saved and he marked them off and it says he predestined them to be his children. Uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse, uh, chapter one, verse four. Notice what Paul says. Just as he, God, chose us in him, in Christ, before when? We chose us before the foundation of the world. So before this dimensionality was created, he chose me, uh, that he predestined me, you, that we should be, notice comes a responsibility, free will, holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Why did he predestine you to be his child? He just told you why, because he loved you. He loved you. But then he didn't predestine everybody, did he? Does that mean he didn't love them? But what, are the, what does it say in the gospel? For God so loved who? The world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son. He loved the world, but he knew of those that he loved, the world, that there was another group that he loved that would be his children. 
And we'll get into whether that's fair or not in just a minute. How about 1115? Um, Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from the 1800s, said this about the predestination of God. Quote, that God predestines and that man is responsible are two things that few can see. They are believed to be inconsistent and contradictory, but they are not based on the law of non-contradiction. I'm sure that's what he was talking about. It is just the fault of our own weak judgment. He says two truths cannot be contradictory to each other. Law of non-contradiction. Um, from Aristotle. He says, I then, I, I then, if I then find in one place that everything is foreordained, that's true. And if I find another place that man is responsible for all of his actions, that is true. Uh, and it is my folly that leads me to imagine that these two truths can never contradict each other. He says, these two truths, I do not believe, can ever be welded into one upon any human anvil. But one, sh one they shall be in eternity. These two lines are so, are, are constructed so that they are so nearly parallel that they shall, uh, if anybody pursued them to the fullest, you would never completely understand them. But he says they will converge one day at the feet of the throne of God Almighty. I tell you, I get chills even thinking about it. I, I truly do. Because this is so beyond thinking, but I understand it to a degree. But one day when I have the mind of Christ and can look at how he did things and why he did things, I will stand and go, praise be to your name. You knew exactly what you were doing. I just couldn't understand it with a finite mind completely, but I know that you predestined because you shed, said you did. If he foreknows all those who will be saved and not saved, if he predestines those to be saved and not saved, then that leads to the doctrine of election. Then he chose. And these all happened like, like instantly. Uh, he elected, Romans 8. Whom he predestined, these he also called. That's the doctrine of election. Whom he called, these he also justified. He called, he called, he chose. I can tell you what, what I've heard many times in my lifetime. So you believe in the foreknowledge of God? Yes. Do you, do you believe uh, in predestination? Yes. Do you believe in the election of God that he chooses? Yes. Do you believe in free will? Yes. Do you understand how they all go together? No. 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 I'm not God. But I know he chooses. So then comes the follow-up question. It's so unfair. Yeah. It's unfair. Why? Well, he chose some. He didn't choose everybody. I mean, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets in. <laughs> no, no. Says he chose. It's not fair. Which the answer to that uh, retort is, is this. What would fair be from God's perspective when man sinned in the Garden of Eden? What would fair be? Fair would be an absolutely holy God who had two people who willfully shook their fist in his face, defied his law, his Torah. That defiance would have met with complete vaporization and God was done with mankind but what did he do he chose to be merciful and gracious and send the Messiah that's what he did that's called grace and mercy the fact that he would choose me you 10 people 10 million people etc the fact that he would choose X amount to be saved that's his business he didn't have to choose anybody that's called grace it's there's nothing unfair about it at all it's God being completely fair in light of who his person is. John chapter 8. Jesus says to the Jews that are unbelieving as they look at the evidence of his Messiahship, why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil. My willful choice. And you, do, you, do, you, do, you, you want to do the desires of your father. And he was a murderer from the beginning. Remember Cain and Abel? He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks... He speaks a lie. Uh, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and he's a father of lies. And, and they say Jesus never really confronted people because he was loving and kind all the time. Remember, he loves truth. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. You have a free will, he's telling them to choose whether you trust me as the Messiah or not. It's your free will. Now, Jesus knew among them, I'm sure, in his omniscience, who would, who would choose and who would not. But from their perspective, he's telling you, you're all rejecting me on your own free will. You're accountable for your decision. Does God choose? Yes, he chooses. Well, how do you know if he chose you or not? Well, if you embrace him as Lord and Savior, you're it's ab absolutely instantly just revealed you're one of those. But there's also those who reject him. That's your choice. Your willful rejection. He wants you to embrace him. 
because he does not take delight in the death of the wicked, as he says. And so if God does all those things, foreknowledge, what's the next one? Predestination, election, it leads to justification. If he chose you, then when you get saved by faith, in his courtroom, your sin is forgiven. The slate is made clean. And then he says, if you're justified in God's mind uh, in his courtroom at the moment of salvation, in his mind, it's also as if you are glorified. You know, when I die one day and I'm in God's presence and I see the glory and I shine as the stars of heaven as prophesied, that's the future, eschatology speaking, eschatological speaking. But, but Paul says, it's as if it's now. It's as if you're glorified now. Talk about hope. Which leads to what I really want to talk about today. Verse 29. I mean, that's the plan of salvation from God's perspective, as intricate as it is, but I'm not supposed to get hung up on all the details of all that. I'm supposed to focus on verse 29, the plan's purpose. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Sum morphos, highly emphatic in Greek. Uh, have you seen Iron Man? What happens with Tony Stark when he becomes Iron Man? He leaves Tony and puts on this suit of armor to take on evil. He morphs into the Iron Man. So he says, you should be morphing into the likeness of Christ, more so every day than you were yesterday. He saved you. He called you, predestined you, etc., to morph into the icon. That's the word in Greek. It's the icon. It's a word used for making coinage, that when they would use a die to make coinage, when they would make a coin, it would look exactly like the original one. It conformed to that. What is your job? Not to be able to explain all the four views of predestination, as, as interesting as that is. Your job as a believer is when you get to the end of the week, your wife can look at you and say, honey, you are so like Christ, more so this, this Friday than last Friday. That you're, yeah, as a high school student, that your friends at school can look at you and say, you are totally a changed individual. Why? Because you study Jesus and you conform yourself to him. I'm a student of Christ. Not just so I know facts about him, but so I can become like him. What was Jesus like? Compassionate. Uh, spoke the truth, called sin, sin. Fearless when it came to truth. Servant of servants, prayed for others early in the morning. Loved all ethnic groups, did he not? Loved all sinners, called them to repent. Didn't retaliate when he was wrong. Didn't use pejorative terms against his enemies. He's amazing. Paul says, you've been saved so that your life conforms to his. What an awesome privilege. And he empowers you to do it. And if you're one who doesn't know him, well, he waits the day for you to make the decision to embrace him by faith. And when you do, you're one of his called ones. Let's pray. God, we, uh, we stand in awe at the depth of your word. Uh, truly challenges us to walk with you by faith. Uh, it calls us to understand things at a deeper level. But at the end of the day, it calls us to conform our lives to be like Christ, our Savior. Uh, we thank you for his image as portrayed in the, as the Gospels. Might we study him well and live well for him. And we know that his life was all about giving, giving his very best. And we do that as we come to tithes and offerings. Might our sacrifice of our finances be a small reflection of our love and adoration of what you've done for us. Amen. God bless you.